Greetings, Cleveland, and welcome to Creative Focus, the show that illuminates some of Cleveland's most talented and creative artists across the genres of film, dance, music, theater, and visual arts. I'm your host, Cornell Hubert Callum III, and today I am thrilled to have on our show, Creative Focus, award-winning poet, playwright, and my dear friend, Dr. Mary Weems. <laughs> Mary, welcome to Creative Focus. Girl, let's chop it up. <laughs> Thank you, Carol Moon. I'm happy to be here. It's good to see you. A pleasure to have you. You know, I'm, I'm so uh, enamored with your work. I mean, I, you. I, I've, I've admired you for a long time, despite us being friends. Thank you. Um, you're so, like, talented in terms of you take topics that uh, are relevant and then you put your creative spin on them. Like in 2011, you had the play Closure that was premiered at Caramu House yes. that detailed the foreclosure epidemic yes. uh, in the city of Cleveland and, and what uh, African Americans had to face. And then you had uh, Meat yes. that detailed the 11 women who were murdered um, by the Anthony Sowell. Yes. Um, and then there was another uh, play that you wrote that dealt with the abuse of uh, uh, black women for police. What was it? What had that title about the... Oh, that's the Crack the Door for crack, Some Air. Crack the Door for Some Air. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, you've always been on the forefront uh, for that. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why I, I admire you as an artist. But let's, let's rewind, rewind right quick. Okay. And so how did this, uh, this artistic literary, your writing ability, how did all that start? Where did that begin? Well, I'm the oldest of four. My mother was a single parent. My first address was 2507 East 86th Street. And I mention that because mama used to make us go to bed early so she could get some rest. And at the time we were so young, we all slept in this bed together, the four of us. And I would make up stories for my sisters and my brother until they went to sleep. Unfortunately, I didn't write them down. I never saved any of them, but I would make them up every single night. And um, they still remember that. So that was one thing. Then when I turned 13 years old, I didn't have my father in my life. And um, I was feeling kind of bad about that. I used to wonder, why doesn't my daddy want to be around me? So my grandmother bought me these cheap black and white composition notebooks that people still use today. Mm -hmm. And I started writing in order to feel better about myself, to express my frustrations. And um, because I, I found that I love to write. Okay. So that was the start. Okay. And, and when was the swag moment when you said, hey, you know, mm -hmm. I can do this. I can, I can be successful at, uh -huh. at writing. You know, everybody has that, that moment. Uh, on an earlier show, I talked about the moment for me, I was in junior high school mm -hmm. and I had to write a, uh, a, a short one page essay. And I wrote an essay entitled, Why I Wanted to Be a Texas Ranger, which was crazy <laughs> for, for a little urban boy. But my teacher, Miss Evans, just praised this uh, essay. And she took it and placed it on the blackboard. And I had an A plus and stars. So that was my moment. When was the moment when you, you said, hey, I can be a successful writer? My grandmother was the only person I showed my writings to until I was in my 30s. And I used to keep them in an Amazon puzzle box she gave me. So my grandmother was the first person to say to me I could write. But the, the distinction is people used to say, well, what do you, how are you going to make a living out of that? Mm. So it wasn't a pri It was more like something of a hobby for me. So you fast forward 20 years. I took an undergraduate course with Dr. Nula Archer. And something in the vibe between us said, show her some of your work. I got 10 pages of my poems in the very next class. I brought them to her and I asked her if she would consider reading them. And she mm -hmm. said, yes. Very next class, she kept me in her office for over an hour telling me, you have talent, you have a voice. Now, what are you going to do about it? That marked a shift in my whole life. 
because I was planning to finish my undergraduate degree and go to law school. But when this person told me that not only do you have talent, but it is possible for you to use your writing ability and make a living, I was off. That's what did it for you. Yep, that's what did it for me. But by then I was in my 30s. So you've been a successful uh, playwright, uh, produced playwright, mm -hmm. published poet. Um, in 2015, you won the um, Cleveland Art Prize for yeah. your play, Meet. Yes. Um, how do you, do you think it's more difficult for a black woman to have success in the literary field? Um, so when I read that question, <laughs> I actually started laughing because it's more difficult for a black woman to be successful in any field. And that's my total answer to that. Do you believe um, growing up on 86th Street uh, shaped your thinking, your, your ideas, your, the images, um, things that you create in your work? Without question, and it's a funny thing, like a lot of poor um, single parent families, we moved around a lot. So I was five years old. That's my memory of East 86 and Quincy. But most of my memories of living someplace come either there or when I was 13 and we moved into my grandmother's house. I remember other places like 105 in Austin where we used to live in this, this building right on the corner and that. But most of my childhood memories and a lot of what I think um, helps me keep my focus on black people and what happens to us started right there on Quincy. And so I would have to say, yes, that one place had the, the most influence on the person and I, person I developed into. What do you like most about your work, mm -hmm. your creations? writing them. It is such a joyful process. It's like being on cloud nine from the moment I start to write until I stop. I'm truly um, connected, I believe, t to God. So I enjoy writing my work way more than developing, you know, whether or not it's published or produced or what have you. As a matter of fact, Calhoun, I just have stacks of stuff that I've never done anything <laughs> with because once I'm through writing, I just go on to the next thing. So it's definitely the creation. Is there a particular time um, that you uh, use to write? I mean, for example, most of the time when I'm writing, it's at nighttime, mm -hmm. late at night. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of works that I have produced that were produced like at two or three in the morning with ice cream cake and some Gatorade <laughs> um, there. So is it a particular time that, that you like to write or does it, it doesn't matter whenever it hits you? Well, I tell you this, it's never late at night because I'm not a late at night person. I'm up at 5.30 in the morning. I've never used an alarm clock in my life. There's, a, there's an inner clock in me. I typically know what time it is, especially Eastern time. And then I just wake up. So I'm a morning daytime person, but there is no best, the best time for me to write is when I'm inspired. Unless somebody's paying me to write something for them, but anytime I'm inspired, that's when I write. Anytime you're inspired. Yep. And, and that inspiration comes naturally from what would you say? Who know, from, I just never know. I've, inspi I've been inspired by because I love walking in the woods, by a spider, seeing a spider hanging on a web and thinking about how temporary life is and how quickly we can leave up out of here. I've, mm. inspired, I've been inspired by somebody spitting on the ground. Most recently, I, when I was the writer in residence for the Cuyahoga County Public Library, I walked past this sister and I heard her say on the phone, I've been written all my, I've been renting all my life. And I went right into my writer's office and wrote this piece because it made me think about all the years we'd spent rent, renting when I was with my mother. So um, I never know when it's, where it's coming from or when, but when it does, I just. How do you feel about um, 
research for your pieces. I try to, myself, I try to stay away from, from doing research. <laughs> but I know, obviously, with, with meat, mm -hmm. you probably had to do a lot of, a lot of research. Um, how, how do you feel about that mm -hmm. as, a, as a writer? Well, each, each project is different. A lot of times I write plays, and I don't do any specific research. The research is what I've, li I've lived through, things I've read and picked up that I haven't jotted down that are somehow getting inside that piece. But meat, those murders happened in my old neighborhood. Oh, wow. And one thing that I found, I found out several things about his life. He was um, abused by an aunt. When he was in the military, he was married. When he left the military, his wife had never been seen or heard from again. And he used to give barbecues in front of the house. You know, at one time he dated Mayor Jackson's, I think, niece, who mm -hmm. lived downstairs. He used to give barbecues on the tree lawn of that house. So those are some of the things that I found out about him. I found on YouTube a YouTube clip done by one of the mothers who lost her daughter. And one thing that she said that touched me that I put in the play was that her daughter left her favorite sweater that day and she didn't get a chance to hug and kiss her goodbye because she was rushing off to get a ride with a friend and how ba bad she felt about that. So I did, I read news, um, online news articles about the murders and then ultimately I mixed in my imagination. Now you have a, a project uh, upcoming in July. Tell us, tell us something about that project. It's the, the International Border Light Festival is coming to town. And thanks to Playwrights Local, David Todd and, and Tom and um, um, the poet from Cleveland State, who's also part of them, I'm, I'm spazzing on his name, but thanks to them, this is the third time they're going to put up the money to produce Hey Siri. The last two years, the International Border Life Festival got right up into almost time to do it and canceled thanks to the pandemic. pandemic yes. Right. Hey Siri was inspired by Ebony Edwards being down in my basement at the house in rehearsal for my play At Last. At the time, she was about to do all of the different women. So Josephine Baker is in the play, and I said to her, Ebony, look up on your, um, your phone and see if you can find some um, video of Josephine Baker dancing. And so she said, okay, and I heard her say, hey Siri. I'd never heard it before. I didn't know what Siri was, <laughs> but I was immediately inspired to write. But the surprise for me, Calhoun, was that I thought it was gonna be a play about how messed up technology is and how it's addictive and blah, blah, blah. But that's not what came. Instead, what came was these characters from very different backgrounds, living all over a city, just like Cleveland, lonely, and they were seeking some sort of um, refuge, and they turned to their iPhone for it. And that's what the play's about. Let's talk about um, an idea of, in terms of play, playwriting and poetry. Do you think there's an overlap, or do you think uh, there's a fine line drawn? Because you have experienced both uh, as a published playwright and, and poet. Mm -hmm. uh, what, do you, what, are your, what is your take on that? Well, no matter what I'm writing, whether it's scholarship, essay, plays, I'm always a poet. And so figurative language, I'm using simile, I'm using imagery, I'm using assonance, I'm using alliteration, allegory, I'm using all of that rhyme. So no matter what I write, I think my poetic voice, which always gets in there somewhere, helps make the piece stronger than just straight, straight writing. So do you don't have a preference then if you, you don't have a preference, poet, playwright, play? Because my poetry, my, po my 
poetic use of language always gets in there. So, but if I had to say, first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a poet. So if, if God were to say to me right now, you can only write in one genre, there's no question. I would never write another play again as long as I live. <laughs> It would just be the it would just be the poetry. I write poetry, yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. What impact do you think your plays and poetry have on an audience? Or what impact would you like for them to, to have? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm I'm blessed. I've been writing long enough, I've taught in enough college classes where I've used my work in K through 12 schools where I've used my work and just among adults that people have shared with me the impact of my work on them. And as an example, I finished my PhD. I walked in 2001. There's a young man by the name of Hank Samuels who's pursuing his PhD at the University of Florida who contacted me a couple of months ago because he plans to use my theory and my, my import, and my emphasis on the arts in education as the foundation of his dissertation. And that's only because he read the published version of my dissertation, Public Education and the Imagination Intellect, I Speak from the Wound in My Mouth, which also includes my poems. So um, I've had people approach me, like one time I did this, this poem about, called Tracks, inspired by the um, Ansel Kiefer painting of the Holocaust. You know, it's just tracks taking Jews to, the, um, to one or more um, um, <laughs> what is the word I'm looking for? Where they took the Jews to tor torture them and kill them? The Holocaust? Yeah, yeah, part of the Holocaust, taking them to one or more of those places. Okay. And so when I saw it, I thought about heroin addiction, and I wrote this poem about a daughter who's dealing with her mother going through addiction. After I did the poem at the Cleveland Museum of Art, several people came up to me because they thought that I was writing about my own mother. Wow. So... That's deep. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. So you have some poetry that you would like to share with yes. our audience today, right? Yes. And this is from, what's the title of the poem? This is called Two Black Girls. It's an unpublished poem, and it was inspired by me driving past Cleveland Heights High School one day just as class was letting out. Okay, mm -hmm. let's take a look. Two Black Girls. Schools let out. High school students like bees around bus stops on sidewalks. Sharing space with adults puzzled by this energy shot that bounces like handballs into air. I'm road bound. Car moves towards yet another full day rendezvous. Middle 50s marks my face with laugh lines that stay. I catch a glimpse of me as a teen in contemporary clothes. Shoes, purses, eyes so identical, for a minute I'm lost in a hand mirror. I almost look away till they catch me, catch me. Two girls, casual as their clothes, say goodbye. Lean forward, natural as two people shaking hands in public, and kiss, kiss on the lips. I love it. <laughs> How often have you recited that poem? Have you recited it a lot? Um, two black you know, girls. Two black girls. No. no, actually, this will be the first time I've ever recited it publicly because it's it's part of a new manuscript. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any manuscripts that are about to be published? Are you working on anything right now? As a matter of fact, I have two. I have a manuscript called Fall and Response. Which is Ooh, a combination. Like that title. Thank you, thank you. A lot of pe people do. Thank you, but it's it's a, a combination of the Christian notion of a fall from grace, 
but also the resiliency of black folk, including myself, how we fall down, but we always get up. And that's where it comes from. Okay, so do you have a dream project? If there was anything that you could accomplish, um, what would it be? Or yet to have accomplished? Uh -huh. I already accomplished my dream and it happened during the Downtown Urban Arts Festival last year when my short play Slapped graced a New York stage and I won the best short. Congratulations. So, right here, <laughs> you know, that's I should probably it. say that louder. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but as a playwright, you know, having it on a New York stage, that's the even ultimate. as part of it, yeah, that's the, that's ultimate, the ultimate for me. And then the very first time I submitted, I won. And then Reg E. Gaines, who entered, it was a long process. You got interviewed initially, then you got interviewed by Reg E. Gaines if you got down to the final, you know, few, and he said to me, Mary, you, I almost didn't pick this play because of your title. So the short of it is, he said he puts scripts in two piles. If he likes the title, that's his first choice, and then second, he doesn't like the title, but there's something about the synopsis that makes him want to read the play. He said, Mary, your play was in the second pile. He said, and that's because a conversation in an elevator did nothing for me. So through our conversations, I said to him, what about white woman gets slapped in an elevator? He said, I love that. <laughs> and then it got narrowed down somewhere in the production process. They didn't even ask me to slapped. So, so and, and what's, the na what's the nature of slapped again? Just okay. a quick synopsis. Sure, so slapped is based on two things. The Black Lives Matter, movement and my desire to use my work as a catalyst for discussions around race. So it was written to be dis for people to have discussions after it. And I actually have a black and Jewish friend who are very, they're best friends. And so the, there's a part in the play that's taken directly from something that happened to them. So the gist of it is they meet at the elevator. Both of them have rel relatives who live in the building. The elevator stops, and they have this interesting conversation about their lives and racism. Wow. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's make a plug for your upcoming project again. OK. Tell the audience what it is. And I think it's directed by our friend Michael, Michael Oldman. Oldman. <laughs> yes. And I want to thank Michael Oldman and Playwrights Local because Playwrights Local has put the money up for the third time. And Michael Oatman has gotten this piece together for the third time. Unfortunately, the only cast person that's able to come back is Daryl Tatum. Right. But we also have Chelsea Anderson, Lena Metrison, and Michelle Broom. The play is going to show July 21st and 22nd at 7.45 p.m and July 23rd at 7 p.m. at the Old Stone Church downtown, 91 Public Square, 44113. So there it is. Yes, yes. I'd like to thank my special guest, mm -hmm. Dr. Mary Weems, for hanging out with me today on Creative Focus. Thank you. So that's it, Cleveland. We're out. But remember, a true artist is not only inspired, but inspires others. I'm Cornell Hubert Calhoun III for TV20 and Creative Focus. Until the next time becomes our time, be well, be safe.